Looks like we're good to go. Welcome. Uh, welcome to this forum on press freedom and ethics uh, in Minnesota, in the United States, and around the world. Um, tonight we're going to talk about issues of press freedom and ethics and fake news and how journalists respond in what is called an anti-media world. Uh, my name is Mark Nugel. I'm the chair of the Department of Emerging Media at here at the University of St. Thomas. Um, St. Thomas has a long tradition of teaching media ethics, among other things. We have, uh, we think, one of the two longest uh, ethics seminars in the United States. All of our seniors who've ever graduated from St. Thomas have taken the ethics class as their last class since 1959. It's been in existence. Um, we do ethics in almost all of our classes as well. It's a big area of emphasis for us. So uh, I, I would like to thank uh, my colleague, uh, Greg Vandegrift, who's in the back, who did much of the organizing for this, and uh, Doug Stone. Where's Doug from? There's Doug from uh, the WPI for helping with this, uh, us, us with this project. Um, St. Thomas sponsors the World Press Institute, one of the sponsors for the World Press Institute. So four of our visitors here are among the 10 journalists who are in the country for about two months as part of the World Press Institute. Uh, the World Press Institute was founded in 1961. It's the uh, premier organization in the United States to provide international journalists with the opportunity to broadly investigate the country. Our values, our traditions of a free press, our institutions, customs, regions, and people. Uh, the WPA, WPI now has nearly 600 alumni from almost 100 countries from around the world that have gone through the program, including four of our panelists today. I need to mention our co-sponsors. Uh, in addition to the College of Arts and Sciences here at the University of St. Thomas, in the Department of Emerging Media, we have uh, Global Minnesota as a co-sponsor, and the Global Minnesota uh, organization from the second grader to the CEO, Global Minnesota connects individuals, organizations, and communities to the world through a unique lineup of programs offered from the Twin Cities to Greater Minnesota. Global Minnesota takes relevant and timely information on international issues, foreign policy, and cultural topics and provides the space and opportunity for Minnesotans to engage and discuss. And then our other co-sponsor is my former employer and my wife's and daughter's current employer, the Star Tribune, so I better get this right. Um, Star Tribune is the oldest newspaper, uh, oldest daily paper in the state out of Minneapolis. It was founded in 1867 as the Minneapolis Tribune. Uh, that was only nine years after statehood. That's Sid Hartman was the first employee, um, <laughs> still there. Um, it's, the, it's the number one news source in the state for, for local news as well as information and community events. And I don't, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say it's one of the top regional news organizations in the United States. So those are our sponsors. So now I'm going to briefly introduce our panelists and then we'll get started. Uh, and this is in no particular order, so I'll start with Jennifer Bjorhus. You could raise your hand and acknowledge Jennifer is one of two environmental reporters for the Star Tribune. Um, you might remember that she was a finalist in 2019 for a Pulitzer Prize, which is a very big deal in our industry. Uh, that series of stories with three other colleagues, by the way, uh, exposed breakdowns in Minnesota's investigation and prosecution of rape cases and how uh, the system really fails the victims in that case. She's been at the Star Tribune for 10 years, covering business and criminal justice. She's won a passel of awards, and in 2018, she was named the Minnesota Journalist of the Year by the local chapter of the Society of Professional Journalists. So let's welcome Jennifer. A.J. Lago is next. 
AJ uh, joined CARE 11 to help launch the investigative team in June of 2014. He has done a number of investigative reports. I'm sure many of you have seen these reports uh, of, in all sorts of areas, in all sorts of categories. Won many awards for his uh, reporting. I would point out that he won the uh, DuPont Award uh, in particular. The DuPont Award is often considered to be the Pulitzer Prize for broadcast journalists. He won the DuPont Award for reporting about how law enforcement agencies in Minnesota uh, got ripped off in their purchasing of squad cars in a double, double billing sort of scheme. Uh, he's won a George Polk Award, an IRE Award, and just about every other dang thing you can think of. So we're happy to have AJ here. Let's, let's hear it. And if you thought that was good, I got some R free. And I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's like... I'm going to leave because it's, yeah. Anyway, Samara Friedmark is the senior producer for American Public Media Reports. She is the woman in charge of the In the Dark podcast, and that is the best podcast in the United States right now, bar none, I would say. Um, there's no better podcast. She joined APM in 2013, and uh, she's a two-time recipient of the George Foster Peabody Award, She's won the Third Coast Gold Award. You guys will remember the In the Dark podcast for the series on Jacob Wetterling. I'm sure if you're from Minnesota, uh, that multiple year, how many years? That was, dec yeah, I mean, 30 years. Yeah, almost 30 years investigation of the Wetterling kidnapping. And then more recently, the Polk Award was given to them for their reporting, fascinating reporting about the Curtis Flowers case in Mississippi. Many of you, uh, I'm sure, have heard that case, the Mississippi man on death row. So that's Samara, yes. So now we're going to go around the world in about a minute and a half. So I've got Sarah Koho from Finland, from Helsinki. She's uh, uh, a, a reporter and a columnist uh, in Helsinki for a business magazine uh, based in Helsinki. She's secretary of the Business Journalists Association of Finland. She's reported from China, France, England, and Belgium, among other places. And of course, Helsinki, one of the beautiful cities of the world. And in the old joke from 2008, you could probably see Russia from her house, or maybe Estonia. I don't know. Estonia more so, yeah. So that's Sarah. Hamdi Bala, say hi. There's Hamdi, he's from Algeria, from Algiers, in North Africa, of course. He covers politics for the Algerian version of the Huffington Post. Um, most of this year he's been on the ground. As you know, uh, the revolution in uh, Algeria began. Uh, Hamdi told me that he applied for the WPI two-month uh, program about two days before the revolution started. Is that about, that about right? So it was three or four days before the re he got out of the country. They had a revolution. I don't think there's any connection there, uh, but, but there you have it. Um, uh, Hamdi also co-hosts a radio show on Radio M in his country, and he it, it really is a political reporter and it specializes in politics. I think I'm safe to say that. So Hamdi, it's great. And then we travel to the southern part of the tip of Africa, to South Africa, for Kate Bartlett. There's Kate. Kate is uh, born in Zimbabwe, and uh, she used to work for AFP. Now she works for the German press agency in Johannesburg, which, as you know, is the largest city there in South Africa. Um, she writes for the English language a service there for the German press agency. She has reported on, on a, a number of stories, and there's no shortage of stories in the southern part of Africa, of course, including the cyclone. I guess that was probably pretty interesting. Recent cyclone and the coup in Zimbabwe. So you go from the cyclone to the coup. She's reported from Afghanistan and Bosnia, and her first job, she started her career in Cambodia. In Cambodia, so she's got some, some miles under the shoes there. So, Kate, thank you for coming. And Sorana Stanescu, there's Sorana. 
Uh, she is the managing editor and the coordinator of uh, a, a newspaper, an online newspaper in Bucharest, Romania, all the way from Romania. They do a lot of long form writing. We would think of it maybe as magazine, sorry? It is a magazine, so that's why we think of it, of it as a magazine. That works out great. Um, uh, and a very large staff. I was surprised to learn that you had more than two dozen, uh, more than two dozen reporters and editors working there, which is tremendous for an independent. Think about an independent news organization in Eastern Europe with a staff that size. You have to be the largest or among the largest. Not in Eastern Europe. So she was a TV journalist prior, prior to that job. She was a magazine writer for many years and um, uh, is uh, a prize winner as are all of our guests. So Sarana, thank you for coming as well. So we're gonna start very generally today. I'd like to ask each of the panelists to talk first about press freedoms and I would like them to address the idea of what they think the uh, most important barrier to press freedom is in their country or in the United States in the case of the American journalist. What is the most important barrier to, to press freedom in your, uh, in your experience? So perhaps Sarah, we can just go down the line maybe. Can you hear me? Oh, <laughs> yes you can. Hi. I. Uh, like Mark said, I'm from Finland, and he asked me to put it on a map so you know where it is. It's between Sweden and Russia in Northern Europe, uh, part of EU, but not part of NATO, and ranked as the happiest country in the world for a third year in a row. <laughs> um, I, well, I'll, I'll start by saying that Finland is a good country for a journalist to work in. It's not a very hostile media environment like some of the other countries here. Uh, Finland ranks as number two on the World Press Freedom Index by uh, Reporters Without Borders, and the U.S. is number 48. Um, so it is a good environment, but of course it's not perfect, and I would say that the biggest problem is that it's such a small society, a country of only five million people, that we sort of know each other, <laughs> I have gone to the same schools as some of our politicians. We know each other, um, you know, we've had a drink here and there. So it makes it harder to ask tough questions. You have to sort of uh, make a distinction between yourself as a person and yourself as a reporter. Andy. Uh, we don't know each other in Algeria. We are a nation of 44 million people, so it would be hard to know every Algerian. But um, I guess the biggest uh, threat to uh, press freedom in Algeria would be the absence of uh, the rule of law. It's not a democracy. It's, a, it's not a dictatorship either, but it's between the two. <laughs> like uh, an autocracy that pretends to be a democracy. So it is a threat to uh, all areas of life, but it, uh, when it comes to press freedom, a minister or any uh, person in a position of power would and can uh, close down a media outlet if they wish to. And the, the people behind the media outlet wouldn't be able to do anything about it. You could try to sue the government, but everyone knows that it doesn't, uh, it doesn't work. And that's the way the, uh, the government actually uh, goes after uh, media. They don't go after single journalists like uh, many other countries. They don't, mostly they don't arrest or harass journalists. They go after they their employers and their media outlets. They try to strangle them financially. They try to, or they uh, close them down entirely. In the past five years, I think, there were two TV stations that were uh, closed down, de uh, definitely. Yeah. And the, uh, the shareholders and the people behind the, those TV sta stations couldn't do anything about it. So it, it's a decision that came from uh, people uh, in, in, in the Algerian government. And it does, it's not a court decision or uh, anything like that. It just they wake up one day and decide to close uh, a media outlet and they do it. So I, I know you've been gone since the revolutionary period has begun, but in speaking to your colleagues, perhaps, since you've 
who are still there on the ground, has there been a change either direction in the days, you know, the two months or so? Right, so protests are, protests are still ongoing in the country. I would say uh, the government uh, is trying to uh, uh, make it harder for protesters to, to uh, take, take to the streets every week. Um, uh, just this week, uh, a number of uh, activists were arrested. So uh, there is a sense of the, the government uh, uh, cracking down a little bit. On There is no uh, violence. Protests have been peaceful all along, but there is a crackdown in that sense. Have they done any crackdown on, on media companies as well, or on the protesters themselves? Um, there were a number of uh, online news outlets that were blocked access to, to their websites have been uh, blocked in the, inside the country. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Um, so in the greater scheme, I guess I would say the biggest threat is the ownership issues we have in the media in the United States and the difficulty finding a profitable you know, business models in the face of the shift to digital. That's, that's a huge problem. But for me personally, I, I, I deal with records a lot, public records uh, requests uh, to state agencies, to police departments, everything. And I would say uh, the biggest struggle has been um, a, a, a kind of slowly, um, they've been chipping away at our public records laws. Uh, even here in Minnesota where we have pretty pretty great access to public records, but there are so many exemptions, you know, hundreds of exemptions really to our um, Data Practices Act here in the state of Minnesota. And um, that is always top of mind for me. I'm always coming across, you know, records that I don't have access to or that are closing off. And, and with the new, the Trump administration, uh, federally, it has made getting uh, Freedom of Information Act requests filled very, very difficult it's ground to almost a halt uh, with some agencies. I would also name financial vulnerability as one of the main threats to media in general, not necessarily to media freedom in Romania. Um, it may not be a very straightforward threat. Uh, uh, it's definitely less uh, violent or maybe less painful uh, as governments closing down your, your business. Uh, but what it happens in, in Romania is that uh, rich politicians especially have the power to open up and close down TV stations ma uh, mainly as they please and as their financial and political interests need. Um, and that that's why at the end of the day um, you end up with a very vulnerable uh, media environment with the traditional uh, legacy media outlets um, losing their strength and their power because they cannot compete with these media moguls that just put in money uh, just to, to, to close down the, the operation in, I don't know, six months or um, two, two years' time. We've had quite a few cases of, of these um, owners being uh, prosecuted, being charged, being imprisoned, and still owning... Uh, and and uh, influencing the the editorial policies of these TV stations and TV is still the uh, the most the, the media that people people consume the most in in Romania so that's why it's mainly TV they wouldn't uh, put up a paper because th they know how how that goes uh, so that's why uh, in Romania and but also in other countries in Eastern Europe uh, what has happened over the past years is that independent media outlets have become I wouldn't necessarily call them the main source of information, but they have become the most credible source of information because they are independent and people trust that, I think. Um, but as long as you have, you are dependent on rich people's money or you're dependent on commercial uh, sponsorship and commercial ownership in a country that has no philanthropic tradition, and no subscription tradition. People, unlike the Nordic countries where people have, have always also been born and lived in a household with I don't know how many subscriptions to, to how many papers, we don't have that. We are used to getting healthcare, um, education, um, public transport, and information for free. So we would download everything that it can be downloaded um, and 
not pay for, for information or access to information. Uh, be, your um, publication is independent. And how, so what kind of funding model do you, do you use then? Uh, we have a mixed uh, uh, revenue stream. We we put out the quarterly magazine. We do podcasts and all sorts of uh, live storytelling events, conferences, and and other workshops. So we have uh, money coming in from uh, subscriptions and people buying the magazine or buy, buying the ticket to our um, events. Uh, we have uh, sponsorship for, for commercial ads in the in the magazine and also uh, in the live events. And we apply for, for grants, international grants, development grants, uh, mostly like the Google DNI or the European Journalism Accelerator Fund. There are different such initiatives that basically keep us going and have helped us throughout the time to just stay on the market and, and grow as a business. But it's a daily challenge, mm -hmm. of course. Thank you. Um, I'm going to just second exactly what Jennifer said. I think she's exactly right. Um, yeah, I think the, the limitations to data practices laws, FOIA, FOIA laws, um, make it hard for us to do our job. And then, of course, the decimation of local news has been really devastating. Um, well, South Africa is not quite as good as uh, uh, Finland in the press freedom rankings, but I think a lot of people would be surprised to know it's still quite a lot better than the United States. Uh, we came in 31st uh, uh, this year in the journalist uh, for, uh, without borders ranking, and the US came in 48th. So you guys made the playoffs, and we didn't. <laughs> Seven. That's right. So when one position, so I'm sorry for you guys, but um, South Africa is a young democracy, so it's a young free press as well, uh, but it's a very vibrant and strong free press in the country. Uh, as you know, South Africa came out of apartheid in 1994, out of white minority rule, during which uh, newspapers certainly didn't tell all sides of the story and were very much um, state-run propaganda outlets. So when Nelson Mandela became our first president, uh, it is enshrined in our constitution in South Africa as it is in your First Amendment, and that the press is free, the judiciary is free, and in the 24 years of our young democracy, uh, this we, we've held to this. Uh, that doesn't mean they're not threats against it all the time, but uh, the organs of the state do manage to function separately, and uh, the press is highly critical and has held government to account so far. Uh, I'm lucky that I work in that environment and also that I work for a foreign news agency and the German press agency, which is also uh, unbiased, uh, totally free uh, in our contracts. We have to sign a clause saying that we will report without bias or influence of any government, any state actors, or anything like that. Thank you. AJ. Yeah. One thing I think we should make really clear, though, is when we're talking about attacks on press freedom or threats to press freedom, we're not talking about threats or attacks just on members of the working press sitting up here. Uh, our freedom as members of the press is public Anything we do, any of the records that we request, the public can request. So just keep that in mind when you hear talk uh, about attacks on press freedom. That's an attack on the freedom of the public. Um, I think these guys really hit on it here in the US. The biggest threat I see in my day to day is access to records. Um, and we do keep passing laws here in Minnesota that make it harder to get a hold of uh, stuff that the government is holding on to, public records, whether it's body cam video. Um, before, when everything was done with dash cam, journalists and the public could file an open records request and get that. When Now many of the departments are going to body cameras and they passed a very specific law that says except in use of force cases, the public does not have access to that. Where that comes into play, you think about within the last year we've seen um, on body camera in Baltimore, officers planting drugs. 
we've seen in Texas, there's been a lot of journalism done around the fact that officers were faking the race that they put down on tickets. So they were saying uh, Mr. Rodriguez, Mr. Rodriguez was white. Well, he wasn't, and it, they were um, basically juking the stats, making it look like they were being much more fair in the tickets they were issuing. We don't, we can't get some of that record here in Minnesota because of our laws. So it's stuff like that when we talk about access to public records that I see as a threat. Thank you. I, want, I once had a state judge who had a very messy desk tell me that every piece of paper on his desk was a public document. But I fear those days are gone. And those judges are gone, too. I should have taken all those papers and <laughs> just left with them. But um, Second question to the panelists, and then we'll begin to open it up for, uh, to the audience for questions shortly. Uh, and Kate mentioned propaganda. And one of our topics today, of course, is, is fake news. And I just equate the two. In fact, I don't even think the words fake, and I'll just give you my bias. I don't think the words fake and news should go together at all. That's not what the defini definition of news is, actually. But I wonder if we could ask the panelists to, to talk about the circumstances involving the recent phenomena, perhaps, uh, of the use of the term fake news and the accusations and perhaps some anecdotes that they could relate to us from their, uh, from their own work life uh, in, in involving that particular subject. I'm again the boring one because this is not a phenomena in Finland. Our politicians don't go around telling that the press is the enemy of the people and we have a high level of trust in media, especially in our legacy papers and our national broadcasting company. So I have never personally been accused of being fake news. I have never encountered that yet, luckily. We are all moving to Finland shortly, I think. Uh, I mean, yeah, you always get someone on Twitter or something calling you fake news, but that's the exception. But more globally, in, in Algeria at least, uh, the term fake news is not widely used, even if it inspired in recent uh, years some politicians who don't like the press, of course, to call uh, critical media outlets fake news. But more globally, in recent years, I've seen, well, from my experience, the need to uh, maybe uh, debunk or to uh, fact check rumors and uh, conspiracy, conspiracy theories uh, spread through social media that are obviously false. And you feel that it's as a journalist, it's your responsibility to uh, try and uh, set the record straight. Mm -hmm. We um, definitely encounter this in our work. Um, to a certain extent, there's always been, you know, we've always attracted critics, right? And the Star Tribune has always had uh, uh, critics that have accused it of being, you know, the Red Star and that's gone on for decades, but there's definitely a change in the attitude and it's amped up and people feel um, much more emboldened to express more personal uh, anti-media views. We hear the fake news comments. In fact, a colleague of mine even had somebody she called to write an obituary, refused to talk to her because they thought that, you know, we were fake, fake media. And, uh, and that, uh, that was kind of shocking to me. Um, uh, it, it obviously doesn't stop us from doing our jobs or rise, in, in it, as far as I know, at our newspaper to a level of violence or anything. But we have had death threats. I've received them. Um, one that was particularly creepy uh, came from a very articulate person who had f um, created a, an email address for the sender to be my mother and my mother. Uh, so the email came to the newsroom supposedly from my mother and it included my mother's home address in it. So they were sending a message, you know, trying to intimidate us, this sort of thing. Um, and in case you don't think it's, it's real in Minnesota, you know, I just want to point out that we did a, a poll. The Star Tribune did a poll one year ago 
uh, asking, um, do you approve or disapprove of President Trump's description of the news media as the enemy of the people? And 30% approved uh, in Minnesota, which is kind of shocking. Uh, I asked our top editor, Renee Sanchez, if, he, if the newspaper as a whole has seen any impact. And uh, he said that they, they do think that there has been a subscription fall off in areas of the state that went, went, for, went to Trump. So there's been um, that kind of direct uh, impact. And of course, he's fielding lots of people that are saying, you know, don't run uh, stories from the New York Times or the Washington Post. Um, so it's playing out. I think I have two answers to your questions. Um, we and I personally have not been named or shamed as being fake news, uh, and I think it's not a trending phenomenon in Romania, fortunately. We have had one very uh, influential politician the, who was the head of the ruling party and the head of the House of Representatives who did try to, to play this card and who did name uh, uh, media in general uh, as, as fake news and uh, coming up with fake news on him whenever they did an investigation on him. Fortunately, he's now in prison. Nobody knew it was uh, it would happen. It, it did. So, I like stories with happy endings. Like yes. Uh, it's not gone very well for him, but whatever. Um, so uh, it didn't uh, end uh, the way he wanted it. Uh, maybe if he was still around and still in, in, in power, that might have uh, given some other politicians an incent the incentive to use the same, but uh, it has not, fortunately. On the other hand, do we have running around made up false information coming up from obscure um, uh, websites that have a very media-like um, front page, uh, yes, a lot of them. And they are spreading around uh, uh, false information, um, uh, uh, pseudoscience, a lot of it. Um, the, the, the few investigations that we have uh, done on, on such websites prove that they are somehow related to Russia, either Russia-backed or Russia-financed. Um, but fortunately, there isn't this still yet this connection between <clears throat> um, media and fake news in Romania. I was going to ask about the Russia connection and 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 if you've seen that. And yeah, apparently it, the answer is it, yes. It, it's happening, and and Sputnik, which is this, it's 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 very popular in Eastern Europe in general. It's this satellite of Russia Today and and, and the like. It's getting more and more likes and clicks and 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 yeah. Front, front page space. Um, yeah, we, we get a, asked this question a lot, and um, I always struggle a little bit with how to answer it, because actually on my team, which is um, an investigative team at Minnesota Public Radio, uh, we actually don't experience this much. Um, we don't get called fake news. Uh, people don't tell us they're reluctant to talk to us because of that. And I, I, I can't really explain why that is. I don't know if it's... Um, the type of stories we're covering or the format, the fact that we're a podcast. Um, uh, possibly, though our stuff is pretty hard hitting. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure why that is, but I, I know that um, traditionally, yeah, it's just, it's not something we've had to deal with um, over the past two seasons of our podcast. The thought occurred to me, and this could be completely off base, uh, but I was thinking perhaps you would talk about uh, or had experienced with reporting from another state that's far away in the southern United States, and you're from Minnesota, and, you know, there's a relationship <laughs> yeah, yeah, there. Right, so in our second season of our podcast, we it took place in Mississippi, so we were in Mississippi for more than a year, uh, knocking on doors, talking to tons of people really embedded in the community. And I think actually that level of embed um, probably helped because... Uh -huh. It was a town of 5,000 people, and we were there for a year, so everyone knew who we were. Uh, yeah. So no one, no matter what side of the issue they were on, is going to just like yell fake news in our face. I think we were once once they actually know you as a person, um, it's it's harder for them to have that reaction to you. So you felt like you established a level of trust among the citizens over yeah, the course actually, of time. Yeah, yeah, black and white, uh, both pro and con. The point of view of our podcast 
did you get any mm-hmm. feedback as the podcasts were unrolling? I'm sure you did, but yeah. what types of feedback did you get from the locals? Mostly positive, but even, again, the people who didn't like our podcast didn't respond to it. They, they stated their disapproval, but uh, not, in the, not in the context of fake news. And I think part of that, again, is because we, just, this is just speculation, but we have so much time to tell our story. We, we tell it over a 10 or 15 part podcast, so we're talking hours and hours of tape, and we use a lot of that time to actually show our work and show, like, this is what the reporting looks like. And so it's hard for people to say, like, that's not true, that's fake, because we're like, look, we just spent an entire episode showing you exactly how we arrived at that number or that finding. Um, and so it becomes harder to, to contest on a factual level. Um, but this is all speculation. I don't, I don't know for sure whether any of this actually explains it. It's working. Sp- speak from our experience. <laughs> yes. Kate. Um, it's not a term that uh, journalists have to deal with much in South Africa. I haven't been accused of it myself, although... I have had complaints about stories I've written for for other reasons, but it's not a term that's really bandied about uh, yet. And I think the problem um, with what's happening in America is that a lot of countries, a lot of nascent democracies take their cue from what happens in America and what America does. So I think for any aspiring or wannabe dictators on the African continent, to hear the leader of the free world attacking fake news and uh, tweeting out videos of himself attacking uh, CNN in a wrestling match. Um, This kind of thing bodes ill, whereas the US used to be a leader in in terms of defending the press. Um, So yeah, I I think this, a lot of people in Africa would think this gives them license. If if Mm. the US does it, we can too. I think a lot of people probably heard uh, the saying that the devil's greatest con is convincing people that he's not real. I think maybe one of the second greatest cons is convincing people in our country that critical journalism equates to fake journalism, fake news. Um, You do see it, and what I think we're starting to see is a trickle down, not just from the highest office in the land, but from other government agencies, politicians, who are taking their cue. Um, I report on a lot of veterans issues. My investigative unit tackles um, a lot of them really on a a national scale, and it's something we're really proud of. We had a story within the last year where we were working with a Native American uh, Marine Corps veteran from up on Cass Lake and he was being denied a kidney transplant. And he needed the transplant because of his time in his service. He drank poison water at Camp Lejeune. And he's being denied by the Department of Veterans Affairs access to even get on the uh, transplant wait list for years and years, despite all his doctors saying it doesn't make sense. And right before our story was going to air, we received you know, a statement from the Department of Veterans Affairs saying our, the premise of our story was false, made up, and inflammatory. So, you know, what do you do with that? We decided that was the opening to our story. I got on camera and said, I'm going to tell you up front, you know, this government agency says what I'm about to tell you is false and inflammatory. We're going to let you judge for yourself. And uh, like you just said, we lay out our work. Here's how we reached our conclusion. And we showed the gentleman's records where he was given uh, what would account to memory tests to make sure he uh, had a good enough memory, was healthy enough to take his post-transplant meds. And he was given tests, and right in his records we found it saying, you know, he was graded on the Caucasian scale because there wasn't uh, one available for Native Americans. There were um, numerous things like that where even the examiners giving him the tests were saying, we think he did, he did poorly, but we think it was because of cross, cross-cultural factors. He didn't read well. He uh, grew up speaking a native tongue um, and didn't even speak English in his home until he was 14. He doesn't read great, and he didn't know a lot of the words they were asking. He didn't know what an escalator was because, quote, we don't have those on the res. And they took that to say he had 
significant neurocognitive deficits and wasn't eligible to uh, receive a transplant. So we shared that story and laid out the documents for it. As soon as it aired, they gave him another test, and lo and behold, he does not have severe neurocognitive deficits. And uh, just a few weeks ago, I got a call from him. He was getting his kidney transplant after a six-year delay. So that's the power of journalism, and it's one way we really try to combat the narrative of fake news is being transparent about it. Here's how we've reached our conclusion. When we're telling you that there was uh, a bias in the system, here's where we're finding that bias in the system. And here's the records. You read them yourself. I'm not making them up. So we're really careful about not using anonymous sources, about being very transparent in our records, embedding them in our reports, and taking the time, even at the risk sometimes of, we call it sometimes daring to be boring, sharing the records that make up uh, what we're reporting on. Did you hear back from the Department of Veterans Affairs after the report aired? Um, I heard back from employees from the Department of Veterans Affairs on the side saying, uh, great job, but uh, not from the uh, public information officers who were calling it fake. Mm -hmm. Well, we'd, we'd like to open it up to the audience now, and uh, I believe we've got a microphone. We've got microphones at the ready. So our Tommy Media students, student-run media organization here at St. Thomas, we've got a couple of microphones coming around. So if you want to raise your hand, um, we've got a lady there and over there and down here. So ma'am, you. I have two questions. One is for the Americans and one is for the people from the other countries. For the Americans, these days, if you want to find somebody's phone number, the internet practically wants to tell you their entire history. So when you tell me that it's been tightened, to me it's getting embarrassingly loose about the things that people don't have any privacy about anymore. My question to the other reporters from other countries is, do you rely on or trust AP and UPI? We'll start with the Americans, perhaps, and answer that. Is privacy? I can tackle that somewhat on it. Yeah. As far as phone numbers, for years these were things that were in phone books. Can you guys hear me all right? Sorry about that. Um, now, most people use cell phones, and where we do get most of our, our cell phone numbers are from credit agencies that sell that information. It's not a government, you know, putting it out there, but if you put your phone number on, uh, you name it, it's probably out there on the, on the internet to be found. So there is a lack of privacy on a global scale. I don't think that's a, an issue of freedom or tightening from on behalf of the government. I don't know if someone else has a different view or take on that. Jennifer or... Uh, was, uh, I'm sorry, I may have missed part of the question. So the question was that it seems like there's less privacy now because people can find your phone numbers. And so you weren't sure about what we were saying about the, the like, uh, type Seems like a conundrum, documents. right? Public records are harder to uh -huh. get, but phone numbers are on your table. Uh, yeah, I mean, I actually don't find phone numbers easier to get. Well, a lot of the, that information, I think that kind of information was always public. I think you're right that in some respects, some of that stuff is, especially the criminal record stuff, has gotten, in some respects, easier to access as it's been put online. Um, I think that's that's definitely true. But um, but when we're talking about records from the government rather than records from individuals, uh, there have been limitations put on those. So when we're talking about like reports from government agencies or data from government agencies. Anything to add, Jennifer, to that? You look like you're thinking hard. Yeah, I'm thinking hard. It's such a, it's such a, you know, deep and serious subject. You know, the the privacy issues are huge, and they come up a lot. And I'm, I was 
trying to think. I, I think the real change has been, like you said, has been, um, you know, that they're digital now, the records, and that changes the accessibility. Um, I always err on the side of, you know, a, a free flow of information. So um, I may differ uh, from other people on that, um, whether, you know, that access is good or bad. I have a quick anecdote on the access to information. I live here in uh, St. Paul. And about three years ago, um, uh, a young girl was kidnapped in a park here and taken to a nearby building and hor horrifically sexually assaulted. Well, everybody in the neighborhood had been complaining to the police about the suspect um, for a couple weeks. He was acting extremely strange in parks, near children. Lawyers in the neighborhood were checking this man's background on Minnesota's court access site. It's called you know, the public access site and it shows nothing but traffic tickets. The police get called and they say, this man doesn't have a criminal, a criminal history at all. There's nothing to worry about. But the truth was, in Minnesota, there's a very different set of uh, public records that you get when you go to the courthouse, find a place to park, go inside, go through security, and get on a public access terminal there, as opposed to your computer at home. And in fact, he did have sex crimes on his record that he'd been arrested for and for which he'd been proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt but because of his uh, mental illness status he didn't have a conviction on his record so there was a big disconnect in what pu people thought they were getting as verifying that this gentleman was safe and what the reality was and so that's some of the issues when we talk about access to records access to the public having records that uh, I, I think is so key. How about our international friends? Would you address that second part? Sorry, question was whether I trust AP and UPI, right? Well, I must admit that I don't know what UPI is. I know what AP is. They still owe me money, UPI. <laughs> I, I, but if the question is much whether I trust foreign wire services, the answer is yes. I work for a wire service in Finland, and they have a very strong code of ethics, and I've never been through such a thorough editing process than I was when I worked there. And um, I now work for a magazine, and we buy stuff from Reuters and Bloomberg, and it's quality journalism, and I don't see any reason to question it. Yeah, the same. I mean, I trust AP when it comes, especially when it comes to American news. I mean, it's the biggest, maybe probably the biggest news agency in the country. When it comes to Algeria, it's a different story because I know that the government doesn't allow them to have uh, enough staff to cover the entirety of the country. So they don't put out a lot of stories on Algeria anyhow. But yeah, I do trust AP. Very similar answer, yes, we do, and I trust them. I can't say we, we use them a lot in our work because we're not doing uh, news and breaking news. We get our stories uh, off the street, basically, and talking to, to people. We don't use agencies that much. And I know that actually one of the AP um, correspondents in Bucharest, has, she has been in the country for more than 20 years. Uh, sh and sh through the hard times and when the media was very, very low and not strong enough to speak for herself, she was one of the voices that got the, like the industries, the professions message outside the country. So they are, they are definitely important and they are, uh, sometimes they are even crucial, I think. Well, uh, I don't use AP because AP is a direct competitor. <laughs> so we, we try to beat them, uh, not follow them. Um, I, I wonder, do you trust AP and UPI? You do? Okay, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Next question. I, I, I saw a hand. Oh, okay, yeah. Testing. Yep. Is that working? Yep, you're good. Okay. Um, I wanted to say that uh, in 
you know, research and, and uh, things I've done for classes here at St. Thomas that I think the fake news uh, problem is a lot more serious than we imagine. And the reason I think that is because of the, the power of ideology that is brought into the equation. If you uh, think about ideology as a belief system where things are right, it's like a religion where things are, are seen as right and things that challenge that as, as wrong, basically, because it's not your ideology, uh, then you understand how fake news travels so fast and is accepted by so many people. Um, I just have an example. I got my oil changed a couple of weeks ago, and, and uh, the mechanic, uh, we have two mechanics, both named Doug, so it's the Dougs, and it was Big Doug, uh, was talking with one of the customers, and they got into a political discussion, and, and Big Doug said, and you know, Obama was selling uh, Lake Superior water to China. And uh, uh, I, uh, 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 I didn't get into the, uh, the discussion, but the guy said, oh, no, Doug, he can't do that. There's, there's international covenants. Says, well, I saw it online. Now, why, why was Big Doug so quick to accept that? It's because it fit in with a worldview that he has of uh, uh, that maybe is a sort of a, a working man's ideology. It's not an intellectual ideology, but it's an ideology nonetheless where things uh, do not uh, seem true unless they kind of fit in with that world view. And it's uh, the definition of truthiness, of course, where it feels right, it feels truthy, so it must be truthy. So uh, how, do you, how do you get beyond that idea of, of a, a belief system uh, that uh, is not going to accept anything you do no matter what? Finland has an answer to that. <laughs> I don't have an answer, but I've been thinking that the fake news concept is not um, a question of journalism being broken. It's your political system that is broken. And I come from a country uh, that has a parliamentary system. And we have like 10 parties in the, um, in the parliament. So our government is always a coalition government formed with multiple parties that don't always agree with each other, but they have to compromise. I, that they cannot call each other bad names all the time because they have to work together. So you see the difference? And here I think because the society and the political system is so polarized, that creates problems in journalism as well, and the polarization I see in American media. And I've been surprised to see how many American journalists are partisan. That, that's not something we do in Finland. Wait, can I ask a follow-up question? Do you think a lot of American journalists are partisan? Yes, well, um, most of the people we've met have been openly against President Trump, that most of them have been Democrats. We went to Univision in Miami and met with host Jorge Ramos, who said that uh, when you have a president who is a liar and a racist, it's not your job to be neutral, it's your job to oppose the power. So to me, this is partisanship. Yeah, this, that's really interesting. That's, um, I think we would never, we're very careful on our team, like on my specific team, um, to be extremely judicious about not being partisan at all on social media and what we say. Um, so I'm, I'm surprised to hear you say that. I mean, I believe you. Uh, you you've had a, a real like survey course of American journalism, but that's um, uh, a little disheartening, I think. <laughs> yeah, uh, I would like to add that <clears throat> I used to uh, believe that fake news is just a new term applied to uh, an old phenomenon, to propaganda and to rumors and things like that. But <clears throat> through talking to people here in the U.S., we've also met a researcher at Stanford who does research on this phenomenon on social media and how small groups of people backed by whoever try to amplify and use marketing tools and strategies to amplify certain narratives and to get them to people who are susceptible uh, uh, of uh, believing those uh, narratives and uh, adhering to them. So, yeah, I don't have an answer to your question, but, yeah, I, I, I kind of changed my view on that. 
Kate? Yeah. Um, I said that fake news is not a common term in South Africa, but then I remembered one uh, fake news story that's being uh, spread a lot in the last year or so, uh, usually not in respected media, but on social media, in some smaller publications, and on blogs and things, and it's kind of similar to the fake narrative you have here that Mexicans are invading the United States, and this narrative in South Africa is that uh, white South Africans, who are about 9% of the population, um, are facing a genocide. And it's just absolutely ridiculous. It has no basis in fact whatsoever, but it's become a very common narrative uh, among white South Africans and was actually picked up and spread by your Fox News by Tucker Carlson, who did a segment on it, and then President Trump tweeted about it. He watched Tucker Carlson. Tucker Carlson spoke to some white nationalists in South Africa, um, and, and, and Trump watched it and then tweeted that he was, he was worried about white South Africans. Well, Mr. Trump, we're fine. Uh, no, nothing's happening. This is a small minority of, of white nationalists, and uh, we sort of have our own outright that are spreading this because they, they want refuge in Australia, they want refuge in Britain, they think they have to run for their lives. And um, I did a story uh, a few months before I came here to try and combat this because it made me so incensed when it became international news because of Trump tweeting it, it, it made it seem like uh, it was based in, in reality and it was not. So I went and spent a weekend with some of the white nationalists up in a mountain area on the border of Botswana. And uh, th this is when I was saying that I have been criticized before. It was by, on, on Twitter after the story came out, these white nationalists saying that I'd given away their hideout. I, I didn't give a street address, but I said the town in which they were collecting ammunition and stockpiling baked beans and, and this kind of thing for, for doomsday when the black majority turns on them. Different kind of ammunition, the big beans. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, they said I shouldn't have named the town, but it's common knowledge that this group is, is up there by the border. So, yeah. Very good. I also think we need to do a better job of pointing out what is journalism and what is gas bags talking on TV. There is a major difference between pick your network, I'm not naming one or the other, where you have people that are not journalists that are hyper-partisan. And that they get called the media because they happen to be on TV, but they're not journalists, they're not reporters. Um, that, that's one thing I think that is, gets lost in a lot of, uh, when we start talking about hyper-partisanship on TV. Are there um, journalists who I think make a very dangerous mistake of allowing their personal biases to uh, play a role in their reporting. I'm sure it happens, but I can tell you in our newsroom, and I think you were saying the same thing, it really doesn't come up. And people that I happen to know are very far in their personal life in one direction are the ones fighting the most to be fair and accurate for, for the other side you will, the, the opposing, what opposes their personal view, trying to look in the mirror and address our, our own biases. I think that's something we try very hard to do. Um, how, to answer your question though, how do you, I don't think you ever change anyone's mind or opinion by telling them they're wrong. I think you do it by presenting facts, truth still matters being transparent in where our sources are coming from, who we're using, where the records are, and um, you know you can lead a horse to water, can't make them drink, but uh, if they stand there long enough, hopefully they will. I, I think that's uh, the best uh, opportunity we have. Uh, another question. Um, oh, sorry. I think we're here and then we'll come over here. Yeah, em Emily, go ahead. Sorry. 
Um, so going off of uh, what AJ was speaking about, I had a question for Jennifer, and it was, how do you combat the people who call your paper the Red Star? For instance, when you're reporting on climate change, how do you let readers know that you're not a liberal journalist talking about climate change, but rather a journalist talking about facts? So I'm new on the environment beat. Um, sorry, I'm yelling. Uh, and so I'm, um, for the first time in this past year, dealing with um, people who deny climate change. And, uh, and um, I'm pretty straightforward with it. I, I get these emails and, and I uh, respond and I you know, thank them for reading. Uh, and um, I just point out that you know, we don't need to engage in a debate about it, but I want you to know that um, I, th I think the research is there, the science is there, and um, so the time for that debate is it's no longer fruitful and here and then I I send um, the reports um, the key reports you know uh, from the panel uh, you know the UN panel and everything and I try to give them the the data and um, uh, suggest that they they look at the facts that the sci the science is there and that's about the only thing you can do for instance on that topic and you know generally speaking people have been very civil uh, when you respond to them that way. Thank you. I'd like to hear from the international journalists how you think the United States might get out of this mess that we're in. From your, your external perspective, I think um, Finland, as we call you Finland, <laughs> Sarah, it, Sarah's point about um, the bias that goes on is really, I, I agree with that, I, and I, I'm a journalist, and it's, it's really difficult as a thinking person not to get really caught up in all this. I'm not a working journalist at this point, but I'm a journalist. It's really difficult to not get caught up in how really horrible <laughs> so many things are, and I think we've I think we've lost all perspective just because it's awful. So I'd love to hear from the international people. You know, tell us tell us your perspective because perhaps you have some insights that you know all of us can go forward with. Can you fix this, guys? <laughs> uh, I can I can try to <clears throat> come up with an answer. Uh, well, I just say, don't get up, don't get caught up in this. Calm down a little. <laughs> Sit down, think through it, talk about it. People have more in common than they are different. Uh, and science has proved that. Uh, quite a few of, of, of the new innovative journalism projects have proved that, have brought people together, people with very, very different and polarized visions and views of the world, brought them together, uh, set, them, uh, set them down, uh, and two hours later, they weren't best friends necessarily. Uh, they they haven't, hadn't changed their, their views on the world, but they could have a conversation. They could talk to each other and they would not hate each other at the end of the day because they were looking each other in the eyes. So uh, yeah, don't be so quick to react. I'd say as a, as a person or it's even as a journalist, um, don't get caught up in the fire. I know that's very difficult. Um, and otherwise, I don't know, um, talk, to your, talk to your neighbors and talk to the people who think who have voted um, a certain way in 2016 and, and try to understand why that has happened. Because I, I can't unfortunately remember who said this to us on, on one of our lectures, but America is not, it's not just the country that voted for Obama. America is also the country that voted for Trump. But these, both these two Americas live together next door to each other. So just, yeah, maybe talk more with less nerves, I guess. Sarah has uh, an idea. in the Nobel Prize for Peace. Um, 
I think, you know, you just wait it out. Time will correct this. If you look at young people, how smart they are, they believe in climate change, they believe in equality, they believe in same-sex marriage. I mean, they are great. And people are moving from the countryside to cities all the time. Uh, immigrants are getting the right to vote. Uh, if you look at Texas and uh, Florida, they might become swing states and eventually blue states. You just have to wait out. The Republican Party will die, and they will have to change. <laughs> wow. I, um, Top I that, think, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> I think that the American media has actually done a really good job uh, speaking about the legacy newspapers, for example, in covering the last two and a half years of what must have been extremely difficult to be a White House correspondent at this time. I, I think they're doing um, a hell of a job, actually. And I, I don't necessarily agree that uh, in times like these or in situations like this, uh, all sides need to be given, granted, equal gravitas. Um, I don't think you need, for example, as a journalist to uh, write about climate change and have a denier in your story as well as a scientist every time you do so. Um, I think there, there's fact and, and there's truth and when there are lies, the press should call them out. Uh, I don't uh, I don't know how you fix this. I don't have an answer, but I can just say that I can relate. I mean, uh, covering protests in uh, in Algeria, you see people on the streets, and I'm also a citizen, uh, and I see people on the street aspiring to democracy and demanding the rule of law and hold, trying to hold uh, politicians accountable, and I agree with them, but I'm also a journalist, so how do you keep that critical distance and report on what's happening on the street when you're you also want to protest and you also want change. But I try to, I try to keep that distance and look at the big picture and do my job. So the best you can do as a journalist is do your job. I mean, maybe the problem is not the polarization or the anti-immigrant sentiment. Maybe problems include automation and AI and stuff like that. Maybe share a story on that instead of telling people they are wrong. I don't know. So there's a very unusual but specific law in this state that you can't just lie in an election for the purpose of denying somebody or confusing somebody. You can't say Republicans vote on Tuesday and Democrats vote on Wednesday. It's against the law. But journalists typically strongly defend the freedom of speech, might think that law steps over some line. We don't use the word fake news, we call it a lie or false information. But I'd like to get your reaction to, you know, taking steps on things that are critical to society's functioning, medical issues, the right to vote, things that might relate to the rule of law. What do you think about saying that's not okay? That is over a line where freedom of press is not a higher value than lying about elections. So does uh, free press trump, I use that word advisedly, does free press supersede lying? lying? Uh, should, it, should misinformation be protected under uh, First Amendment protection? I think there's a difference between being protected under First Amendment and being called out for what it is. Um, I can say my, my TV station, and uh, it's actually across the company that owns us, it's Tegno, we own TV stations across the country, run segments uh, called Verify. And they're done you know, all locally, and they might take a topic like that and really pick it apart and say, look, here's the sources we're going to, 
here's the people we're talking to, and we're fact-checking this issue. I think it's just about being transparent in what we say and the conclusions that we reach, and there's a difference between something being protected as free speech and our job as journalists to seek truth and to uh, seek facts. I don't know if that answers your question. That's over my pay grade. <laughs> um, sorry, I've, I've lost track of who's next. Here we go. Thank you. Terry has a question. Yeah, sometimes I think we confuse the credibility of the press with the freedom of the press. And we have a president at the moment who's doing everything he possibly can to destroy the credibility of the press in this country. But at the same time, is he endangering freedom of the press in other countries? where other despots and dictators are taking his attitude as a carte blanche to shut down the media in their own countries. Do you see that? Do the international journalists see any Trump effect in your politicians? Or? Yes, definitely. That's a very short answer. <laughs> uh, and I think, if I'm not wrong, uh, is Hungary uh, such an example? Where, where Orban has, has definitely copied most of, of Mr. Trump's way of handling and thinking of media, and I'm pretty sure yeah, it, it legitimizes, legitimizes a discourse, normalizes uh, language and naming names. Um, so yeah, and there is an important uh, distinction between credibility and, and, and freedom. And what, if, if in the US it might, only affect credibility, but in other countries, the effect is uh, affecting freedom and, and of the journalists and of public information. So. Kate, you have? Yeah, yeah, I think I spoke to this a bit earlier in saying that uh, I think that um, non-democratic or authoritarian regimes do take a leaf out of America's playbook, for sure. Um, and you talk a lot about the uh, um, uh, journalism freedom as a uh, kind of closer connected to the, uh, the democracy. And uh, uh, for me, studying you know uh, culture's influence of um, our behaviors and perceptions and everything, um, do you see that um, journalism freedom is extension of the Western democracy's uh, you know freedom of speech, and so that um, it can the true freedom of uh, journalists can only be achieved or accomplished in a true Western democracy that had to be independent or cannot be independent from the uh, um, the political structure. So in other words, that uh, can those authoritative or authoritarian you know, uh, political structures which coexist in this world have true freedom uh, for the press? Uh, in short, no, <laughs> I don't think so. I think they do go hand in hand. I think we've got time for one more question. Yes, sir, you have the microphone. The American journalists here are from a city, a city the Twin Cities. Um, rural America is where news organizations are failing at, they're either failing or they're being acquired by a certain So news organizations get the point of view, and that leaves them without 
you know, it's, it's not um, fake news. There's no news. So can we speak to what what should happen? I work in TV and I say support your local newspaper. Um, that's where this news desert is coming from is you are losing uh, you know, your small community newspapers left and right as uh, I think Jennifer talked about it uh, as we started tonight, trying to figure out an economic model to, um, to stay afloat. The people that work there need to be able to buy groceries and uh, you know, gas to get to stories and you know, our current economic model for journalism is uh, on the downward slope towards failing at the moment. Other thoughts from the panel? And how about a concluding thought from each of you on some of the things we've talked about tonight? Do you have a, a summary or something you'd like to leave the audience with, perhaps, other than move to Finland? You can start. Oh. How, many, how many journalism students are here in the room? Quite a few. That's awesome. When you have that many young people looking to go into journalism, our profession will continue to thrive. And my best advice for you is get the records. Thanks, Mark, for throwing that one out there. Um, concluding thoughts. Um, and just really that this experience with the World Press Institute, I think uh, my colleagues would agree, has been really invaluable for us uh, nine, nine weeks traveling around America. And even though we read about America uh, all our lives, uh, we read the New York Times, we watch American films, we grow up listening to American music, and we kind of think we know the culture, I think it's nothing beats actually seeing it. And I think for me, one of the things that um, has been really amazing is how different all your states are and how uh, a lot of them are like separate countries almost. Uh, Texas was very different to California. California was very different to New York. Um, uh, they all different to Minnesota. So, um, I think that gives us as journalists a better understanding of uh, the political earthquake that happened in the last couple of years, and um, yeah, has just has just been really invaluable. Final thoughts. Um, it, it's hard for me to end this on an optimistic note. <laughs> AJ, you were so inspiring, but um, I think uh, it's. Uh, it's a troubling time to be a, a journalist now, uh, uh, not just because of the Trump stuff and the, uh, but but really because of resources. And I think um, I think if we don't solve this problem of how to fund news, uh, we're not going to have a media uh, in the next decades. And um, I don't know what that future looks like, but I, I do know that right now the best way to head that off is to. Sup yeah, support your local paper, donate to your public radio station, um, support local news, independent media across the world. Um, well, uh, I had something very smart to say and I really <laughs> forgot it. Um, I, I, I re and I really hope this doesn't sound, uh, I, I, I remembered, sorry. Yeah, don't take things for grat granted. Don't take for granted what you have here. Freedom of whatever, First Amendment, Second Amendment, 25th Amendment, <laughs> they can be gone. It has happened in other parts of the world. It has happened to each of us in our countries. If you, if you uh, take uh, half an hour to read upon each of our country's histories, um, freedoms and liberties and, and civil rights can fly overnight. You can lose them overnight. So be aware of them uh, and, and fight to, to have them for future generations. I agree what, with what my two colleagues said.
<laughs> no, but <laughs> uh, yeah, it has been an amazing experience being here in the U.S. for nine weeks and discovering and learning uh, in depth about uh, different topics. Um, I've read uh, something in a bookstore in uh, San Francisco. It said, uh, democracy is not a spectator sport. Uh, to uh, what Sorana said, uh, don't take uh, things for granted and whatever your lenience is, you should just vote. That's, that's, that's not something that a lot of people uh, around the world can do. This is hard going after all these smart people, but I wanted to say that I believe in international cooperation, in multilateralism, in free trade, and uh, I think that uh, we should all work together. We have big problems to solve, like climate change and the threats that democracy and freedom of speech are facing, and this program has been a good example of that, and I hope we will uh, work together in the future and do fantastic stuff together, because we're stronger together than we are alone. Thank you. <laughs> Let's thank our panelists for coming, and thank you all for coming tonight. These guys will hang around for a few minutes if you've got individual questions, and their colleagues are in the audience as well. If you want to talk to them, they can, you can raise your hands. The w WPI fellows, raise your hands. Yes, I see a few. Thank you, everybody. Safe travels home. Good night. Okay. America. Yeah.